question. I'm Molly Immendorf. I'm the instructional technologist for eExtension, and I'm uh, co-hosting today's uh, session. I'm so happy to welcome you to uh, Make Your Story Maps Shine. This session is part of eExtension's Impact Collaborative. The Impact Collaborative is a proven process developed by the eExtension Foundation to catalyze, accelerate, and amplify local impact. I will be watching the Q&A as well as chat. If you have any questions or comments during the session, and uh, you know, keep uh, Shane on track to make sure that he's uh, answering them. Um, and today, so with that, today's presenter is Shane Brath. Um, he's a geospatial extension specialist with the University of New Hampshire, um, and he's been involved in various ways with the eExtension geospatial community since 2006. Now let's learn how to make our story maps shine. Okay, well thank you very much for the introduction and for all the coordination. Uh, today I'll be talking about a few things that I and other folks have learned to really make the idea of your story maps become something that's maybe more compelling or get people more involved. Uh, when looking at this topic, a possibility that I could have done would be to try to have you know dozens of tips that I would pack into uh, this hour and try to ram all this information down your throat. <laughs> what I decided to do instead was hit on a couple of main key points, at, uh, and you'll see these coming up, and then talk a little bit about each of those points with the idea, of course, also that there might be lots of good ideas in out there for folks attending the webinar about story map trips, tricks, and tips, or things that they've done. So I definitely will give chances to people to have their suggestions, as, as we were mentioned, through the Q&A. So I, I've, we've done a whole bunch of different webinars and story maps. I've done quite a few myself. But just as a brief orientation, the idea of a story map is not necessarily exclusive only to Esri, which is uh, the company shown or pr whose product we're discussing today. But they have one of the more dominant versions of story maps and also one of those that had the most potential capabilities. So ESRI is, stands for, used to be ESRI and is now just ESRI as one of the dominant GIS companies in the world. They have a platform called ArcGIS Online and one of the features of ArcGIS Online which has evolved over time tremendously is something called a web app but more specifically, we're talking about today, a version of that or a type of that called the story map. And the idea is that if you have a story to tell or information to share, whether that be in maps, videos, images, you can use this story map template that they have on their website to stitch all that information together and present it in a compelling way. Now, some of the templates, you don't even have to have maps at all, depending on which template you're using. Some of them are very map-based, but uh, whether or not you're using maps, there's a story map template from Esri that will likely allow you to make an interactive online website, for lack of a better word, in order to tell your story. There are also uh, open source versions of story maps, or I've seen, sorry, an open source JavaScript way to create story maps. And even the story map templates themselves from Esri, you can download and host on your own server. So the template itself is open source. Now, I'm assuming that most people, when they start with story maps, aren't interested in hosting things on their own server or using anything to do with JavaScript. So a lot of what we're focused on in our trainings in general here in New Hampshire and in my work through eExtension has been people using this story map templates right on Esri's website. And um, then whatever you can do within their template are the features that we're covering. Just keep in mind, if you're willing to host them on your own server or you have some coding experience, there's always quite a bit more that you can do. So the sort of the three different topics I'm touching on today is a little bit about planning your story, then looking at some key story map features that you may not know about or maybe not appreciated their full potential, and then a handful of story map tips from my own work and based on some other story map uh, or folks in Cooperative Extension who have used story maps quite often. So after each of these sections, I'll stop and see if there are any questions, but even comments as well, because I'm sure that there's lots of ideas out there on each of these categories. Um, if any of you on the webinar today have anything to share, I'd be happy to hear what that is.
So first, planning your story. And I think this is the section, well, I know this is the section that's the shortest in the webinar, and also the one that I think is uh, so little about story maps in some ways, and much more about storytelling that it would be hard to encapsulate all of the possibilities. But I guess the, the main message that I want to get across with this is that even as somebody who works in geospatial technologies, I really try to focus on the idea that the technology should not drive what it is that you're doing in your job or even in life, is that you should be looking for ways to use the technology in order to benefit you or to do something more effectively or in a different way. And I think GIS in general, ArcGIS Online, and Story Maps fall into this category. So when you think on your mind, oh, I'd like a story map, you start often thinking about what is the technology and maybe even what are all the maps that I can make. But in reality, you really need to step back for a moment before you do anything with the technology and think, what is my story? What is it that I'd like to be able to put into this technology? Because if you let it drive or the story map be developed solely based on the technology or even starting based on the technology, you can wind up producing something that's not actually a good story. And this is a perfect example. This story map will be looking at a little bit later in the interactive sense is based on a project that I was involved with, sort of an ongoing project here in New Hampshire to do cleanup in this Great Bay estuarine area. And I remember very discreetly the first time, or very, um, very strongly, the first time that we met with the team to think about this story map as we were doing the project, I thought, wow, this would be a nice story map. We sat down and they had their computer hooked up to a big monitor. They were all ready to start plugging away at the story map. And I very dramatically just shut the laptop and I looked at everybody and I said, what, what is our story? What are the components of our story? And then let's figure out who in our group are able to do the individual components and also how that fits into the story map template. Now, the good thing about that situation is I knew enough about story maps to realize the total range of possibilities, which is something that's tricky when you first start using any technology. You have to know enough about it to see all the potential. But just to show you, and you'll see, the, as I said, this story map later, how did we plan for this story map was we just sat down with a blank slate and literally said, what is our story? And so we wound up identifying key concepts, and I hate to even say this, but almost thinking as if they were PowerPoint slides. If we were going to give a presentation or we're going to have different frames, what would they be? What would they look like? And so we identified a whole bunch of different topics that we are going to have covered in this story map. And these were just originally just randomly scattered. And then we wound up pulling them together and say, you know what, we have a lot of ideas, but it turns out that some of these ideas are not even part of this story map. And we wound up breaking them into two story maps. So this top section was sort of the story about the project. The bottom section was um, sort of a general story about wildlife in this area and uh, just the general problem with trash. So this was no great very strategic way of doing story planning, I suppose. And there are lots of techniques with storytelling and planning stories. But this was just a very simple, let's figure out our story, get it together. And again, we realized that these were not necessarily all within one story map, partially because it would make the story map too long. And also because we wanted to use this section down here on the bottom separately from this story up here. You can always link to one story map from the other. So then, once we decided these were the total components, we had to break them down and assign them in different parts. And so in the end, it turned out that we weren't even going to do the bottom part of this bottom story map yet. We decided that we would do that in the future, but it wasn't part of this effort. And so then, as the mapping person of the story map assembly team, I wound up just focusing on these, these three sections of the story map. So you might think that this is maybe a little too rudimentary or not worth doing, but I will tell you right now, the biggest problem I find in any technology implementation situation is just charging ahead with the technology without a clear plan. So this process of stopping, and it only took us probably about an hour, figuring out what the key points were and then what individual person would be doing each task really set us up to have a successful story map that was driven by the story itself 
and not necessarily by the technology involved. Now, I know you could do an entire hour, probably 20 hours worth of webinars on storytelling and uh, how you come up with your story, but at least this is one approach that we used for the specific story map that exists today, which you're going to see later. So uh, as I said, this part is short. I don't have a ton of details. And I think in our story mapping classes that I teach, this is still the biggest hole. I don't even know that you could wedge this into a story map class. This would almost be a completely separate class about planning your story. But I'm interested to hear if any folks have thoughts about the best way that they've found for sketching out a story, digital or otherwise, that they're going to tell. So this, in the end, really a story map is telling a story. Anyone out there? Any comments in the queue? Um, Shane, I'm not seeing any right now, um, but I'll be sure to, to highlight them. Um, I know that sometimes just good old uh, paper and pencil, and I'll draw out little diagrams, you know, kind of do a storyboard um, kind of thing. Uh, you know, sometimes low tech <laughs> is, is a great way, or using, you know, uh, Google Docs or something like that where I can share with others. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything magical about this process as far as what how you use it and in fact or what technology you use for this part um right. in fact we did this on paper I dramatically closed the laptop so i <laughs> couldn't open the laptop back up but what i did was write this up and send this around afterwards just so that people would have this sort of rudimentary storyboard in mind sure so we've got a few comments now sure. um, i'm talking about that this is um a uh, notion is consistent with uh, instructional design principles um, and uh, uh, CK likes post-it notes. Um, <laughs> brain, yeah, Elaine uh, shares that brain dumps often help. Um, and let's see, uh, I can't quite get who the name is, but um, uh, someone else has used InDesign to create a mock layout of website mm -hmm. pages before uh, diving into a tag. Nancy shared, uh, definitely agree that jumping in without a story slash plan is not the best way to go, but a pitfall I constantly fall into. I think we all have that. And um, in the Q&A, Daryl uh, says, uh, Shane, agree with mapping out the story on paper first. The same idea when creating prezies or PowerPoints. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And as I said, I think um, just as a bring home point, you'll hear me say this over and over again when it comes to mapping or any design, I guess, or presentation, I'm very much focused on what not to include. It's very easy to get very excited and try to include so much that you lose the main point or lose so lose the point you'd hope people get, which I thought was interesting in this process. All five of these elements on the bottom, we thought originally were a very important part of the story map and then realized we really didn't have time to do that. And those could be completely separate. So, all right, great. All right, the rest of it will be more specific and focused on story maps themselves versus sort of planning of a story. But So this may seem simple, and this is not necessarily of a story map per se versus any map you're making online, but I think it's really important when you consider story maps, is what is the background of the map that you're using? And the more you use GIS, the more you consider this, it seems trivial and it seems like a throwaway, but I think the more that you use maps to communicate, the more important it becomes. So there are lots of different ways to make online maps. In fact, the maps that you feature inside of a story map don't even have to be built in ArcGIS Online. Any map that you can get an embed code for or any web page that you can embed, you can have inside of a story map. But for the moment, I'm assuming that you're using the mapping part of the Esri software in ArcGIS Online. But even if you aren't, you should still consider this, that the default background may not be the best background for your map. And for example, if you start ArcGIS Online, and I'll actually show this tangibly in a minute, you get this sort of plain old topography background map. 
not necessarily a bad background map, but one of the features that you can do is in addition to laying on top of it any other aerial photography that you can find through ArcGIS Online, they also have this series of base maps that you can put in. And uh, you can see that there's a whole bunch of different types, types but some then I do this in every class I teach with ArcGIS Online and Story Maps to pull out and emphasize that they have these two here in the middle, dark gray canvas and light gray canvas. And if you see what dark, dark gray canvas looks like, you might think, wow, that's you know, mostly useless. It doesn't give me that much information. But in a way, that's sort of the point, not that it's useless, but that it doesn't overwhelm you with information. It just provides a background context on top of which you can display your data. Uh, and I find very often when people are having a map in the background, sometimes they really want aerial photography or they want topography, but instead they should be thinking about what's the best way to give my data context so that people can see my data instead of worrying about the features in the background of the map. And especially with aerial photography or topography, there's so many colors in them already that then choosing the colors of your data to show on top of them in a way that's going to contrast appropriately for people to see it, let alone, um, I mean, people with sort of standard vision or even considering color blindness, it's really important to consider the background color of the map. And if you look here, for example, this is what an ArcGIS Online map looks like. You can see their standard map. Part of it could very well be the scale that you're showing it at as well. I mean, if you look at this here, this probably looks like a decent background map. And in some ways, if you click on dark gray canvas at this scale, it, I would even argue it's not all that useful. Um, but if you look at, for example, what this map would look like if you were zooming into a certain area, I'll just go in here, for example, to Boston. If you were showing data on top of this, if you notice, because it's trying to do the topography and use different colors of green and different colors of gray, this actually turns out to be pretty visually um, chaotic or messy. If you use this dark gray canvas, it simplifies quite a bit. Uh, the other thing that's interesting in this, these approaches is as you zoom in more, more information becomes available selectively. So they produce different resolutions of data in this map. You can see if you zoom out a little bit here, some of the roads disappear and some different names appear. And so it provides this general context to your data without overwhelming you with information that's likely um, going to be distracting. Now, sometimes you might say this still doesn't work or you like the dark gray versus the light gray, um, or even that, you know what, we really do need to see aerial imagery because the aerial imagery speaks to the type of information we're trying to communicate. I think either case that's fine, but I think that the main point is just the background of the map should be an intentional decision, which is based on the idea of communicating effectively the information you want people to see, while at the same time reducing the amount of complexity of information you don't want people to be distracted with. I think that's general in presentations overall, but I find people, especially when they get a lot of map data they want to share, they get so excited about putting it all out there and putting things they think would be necessary, they don't stop to step back and think, what is sort of the minimal amount of information I can provide in my map, which gets the point across, which allows people to focus on what they're trying to tell the story of, as opposed to all of the information, which becomes overwhelming. Okay. Another interesting feature, which I think is actually one of the most compelling features of all, of story maps is something called story actions. And it turns out these used to have a different name, but now they're called story actions. And they're only available in this map journal template, which is something that as you look through a lot of story mapping uh, use, uh, a lot of the narrative story maps where you're really trying to lead people through a specific tale are using map journal, partially I think because people just like the style and also I think because of these story actions. So what this means is it allows you to have different functions inside of the map that the other ones don't. And I can just equate them to the idea that, a, and you'll see an example in a minute, that a map journal is almost as if it um, was a coffee table book. You're sort of flipping through the pages, and I say that story actions are like being able to automatically turn the page to the correct page at the moment you want to or even having additional folds that come out away from the book to provide more information on the subject you're looking at in that moment. So 
without going scrolling up and down the story map or going to different sections, you can change the main stage, which means you can change what's on the right. So, so to show a new map, a new area of a map, an image, a video, you can also allow it to locate you on a given map based on a set of conditions. So if you wanted to go to a certain city or a certain intersection, and you can also move to another section. So right built within the map, you could say, you know, click this area to view the maps in Vermont, and you can scroll down automatically to another section in the map. Now this allows much more interaction and navigation throughout your story, and it allows people to see uh, additional information without moving to a new section of the map. So how that looks in practice, and this is an example of a map journal. It was released uh, in 2016, about the 100 years of the National Park Service, and it shows every single national park as you scroll down here chronologically. And one of the things, as I mentioned with these story actions, you can see here, it says view park as natural, so view as national park service map, satellite imagery or topographic map. So instead of having to scroll down to another section to see that map in a different format, you can just simply click here or here or here to change to a different view of that map. And since these were built in ArcGIS Online, these are interactive, you can move around the map. And depending how you have this set, those zooms can either, sorry, these clicks can either reset the zoom so that when you click back to satellite image, it pulls it back out to the whole extent of the map, or you can have it set that the map itself doesn't change the zoom level and instead it just changes the features of the maps that are being shown. So this ability to have these story actions vastly increases the potential for this map to be interactive since by clicking here, you can add additional content here. Although it's not done in this map, you could say, uh, you know, maybe have the most popular or the most commonly used uh, national parks right at the top where you could click and it could automatically scroll down to that section of the map. Or you can allow people to move around the map by having links here, which have different names of cities or locations that you want them to be able to view on the map. So again, this is only in the map journal and it's something called a story action. And when you're editing the map, right in the section where you're building, sorry, let me bring this back, where you're building this sidebar here in the map editor, story map editor, you'll see this little thing that says story actions and each of these three buttons will allow you to add that additional feature, making it much more interactive and rich. Okay, I have one more section of this, but I feel like this is probably a good time to stop just to see if anybody has any questions on, or comments on either of those two. So the only comment I see is back from the earlier discussion. I just, uh, Mark uh, added that another way to plan is to use sketch notes. Um, which is mm -hmm. part of a design thinking process. Good, great point, definitely. And I think, you know, it's funny because I'm now based on my interactions and design-a-thons and I'm very into concept mapping. So I'm sure a concept map <laughs> could also mm -hmm. be used uh, to, to lay out a story map. Absolutely, and that kind of harkens back to the use post-it notes. Yep, oh yes, yeah. definitely. Okay, one other, this, so this final maybe key features of a story map, uh, while it's not exclusive to story maps, it is really built in now in a very easy way to ArcGIS Online, which allows this potential to happen in story maps, is thinking about getting feedback from people. So a lot of our storytelling may involve us communicating, but also could involve us wanting information back from people. And uh, the same thing with story maps or just generally outreach through extension using the web, you would like sometimes to get feedback or collect information. And we could use the variety of ways that people have used them for a long time. It could be information you sent by email, it could be SurveyMonkey, it could be Qualtrics, whatever it is, whatever your survey collection tool. But the great thing now about ArcGIS Online and Story Maps is there's very easy ways to set up data collection so that you can have people give you information and that information can be piped directly into a layer that will show up on a map. Whether that's a map as a standalone map 
or a map that's featured in a story map. So in a story map, you could have on the sidebar a little link that says, Show, tell us what you think. And people could click on it. A form could pop up. You can control what that form looks like. If you've ever built SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics forms or any of those other types of sort of online survey or evaluation forms, it's very similar. But the difference of this is since it's built in the background using ArcGIS Online, and then can have information that shows up directly as part of your story map or your map. Now, of course, depending on the information you're collecting and how you want to use it, you might, you, there are various ways that you can either have the data show up directly if you want, or have some of it held back, or have you have to make a few changes behind the scene as data come in in order for them to show up on the map, depending on exactly what you're trying to do. You can come up with a workflow for that. But the reality is now it's very easy to have information in that's shown on a map. And only in the past year and a half or so have they made it easy for people from the outside to contribute data, even if they don't have a login inside of your ArcGIS Online account. Because in the past, in order to, for it to be really easy for people to submit data, they had to have a login. And obviously, if you have a story map that you're trying to use as outreach, you're trying to get people engaged, you don't necessarily want to have, to have every single person have a login in order to give you data or give you their thoughts or give you their opinions. So now there's several new approaches using story maps where you can do exactly that through ArcGIS Online and create something. You have to have an account yourself. And in fact, this is one of the types of things you have to have a paid account which any university will likely have, um, or even nonprofits can get it for a relatively uh, small amount of money per year. So one person has an account, one of the paid accounts, they set it up, and then anybody can contribute to the map whether or not they have an account at all. And one example of this is something that we're using in New Hampshire on this rabbit reporting website. So there's a one species of rabbit that's uh, native to New Hampshire, it's a big focus of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department and UNH Cooperative Extension to try to identify populations of this, look at protecting wildlife habitat. So we've set up this New Hampshire rabbit reporting website. And again, using this online form builder, which is called Survey123, uh, is part of Esri's online software. So if you have an account for a paid account for Esri's online software. And again, all those through the universities will have access to this. You can then set up, you can see this form is nothing very complicated, um, but you can also see that it knows that it's date, it knows that it's time, can give you a location, lets you upload a picture. And once you hit submit, these data are submitted through ArcGIS Online. And in the case of the New Hampshire Rapper Reports website, there's a map that's being populated with the data that people are submitting. Now, this one doesn't happen to live inside of a story map, but any map in ArcGIS Online could, and probably at some point this map will live in a story map. And so each of these points will have the data record for the observation, time of observation, zip code. Notice the zip code is an actual text field instead of number, because often if you mess that up, it'll just be 3042 instead of 0342. And then there are, you can also have people upload images of the rabbits that they've seen. And I think this may seem like a minor feature in some ways, and it also may seem like it may not be a part of every story map, and that's true. It may not be a part of every story map. But the idea that you can make online maps and incorporate into your story maps some sort of data collection, which could be funneled into a map, which could be updated real time, or um, with some sort of um, moderator, information that you want to appear on the map can appear on the map, I think is extremely powerful. Not just for story mapping in, in per se, although it is useful in story mapping, but so all uses by, of mapping in cooperative prevention across the board where we're trying to get information, reach out, engage people, and have them have a feedback flow to us. Um, Again, this doesn't have to be part of a story map necessarily, but I think this represents a very big opportunity in your story map to be able to collect information. And it turns out in that story map I just described, we were going to implement this. We didn't wind up doing it, partially because in the end, even though it seemed like a good idea in the beginning, we didn't know what we would do with the information. So if people reported that they saw more debris over time, we weren't sure 
what we would do because unless there's an action associated with that, we felt uncomfortable having people report the data of all the things they were seeing. So we didn't have a future time point in which we were going to deal with the information and try to act on it. Um, so that's why we chose not to use it as part of that website for now. But this represents a giant opportunity to have feedback and information be flowing into your map. And also think about it, it doesn't necessarily have to be from outside of Cooperative Extension. So if even you had people inside of Cooperative Extension that you wanted to pull information from, get them to report the town that they're working in or different sorts of pieces of information to update a map that you're using to share things internally, this could also be a really powerful way to take information in from people who don't even have access to story maps or an account, but have that information and then update a map or update um, a story map based on the feedback and input that people provide. Again, without any an account at all. And up until recently, this wasn't even, uh, even a, a possibility. All right, so I will stop there, see if anybody has any questions on that. So we have one question in Q&A. Hi, sure. Shane. Can we, as the map owner, edit the crowdsource data afterwards, like editing or deleting it? Yes, yep. Yes, it depends on which uh, um, which general approach that you use for how how you would edit that data. Um, there's a few approaches where they have this dashboard you can deal with, and there's others where you just sort of go behind the scenes of the GIS data and edit it. But yes, you definitely can. And even going back to this map, if you see inside of this map, there are um, the eastern cottontails are red. Let's see, I don't think they found any New England. Oh, wait, one. New England cottontail here, snowshoe hare, and unconfirmed. The reason that these, all of them come in by default is unconfirmed. Um, until somebody use it, re reuse the information in the picture, they go behind the scenes and they make an edit in the data. And as soon as they do, then those dots are colored and labeled as snowshoe hare, New England cottontail, or Eastern cottontail. So that's exactly what they're doing. They're going in and editing the data. And then the map is looking to see oh, this one's an Eastern Cottontail, and it changes the symbol, and it changes um, the name behind it. So definitely you can do that. Excellent. I don't see any other questions or comments at this time. OK, great. And uh, so this last section here with story map tips. And this is the type of thing, of course, where, again, you could just have dozens and dozens of tips. So I wanted to focus on just a few key tips. and. Sometimes this may seem obvious, but I've seen this over and over and over again whenever people talk about good approaches to story maps is your first slide or your first section needs to make a really good impression because people are going to have to decide whether or not they're going to stick around. Uh, and I know from um, hearing a lot about storytelling and presentations that the time your audience is the most eager to hear what you have to say is right before you start talking. Really within the first minute, even first two seconds of you start talking, their interest starts to die off <laughs> when they look at it over time. So the very first thing people see has to convince them that they should stick around. So thinking about that, make your first section of your, um, of your story map something that's going to grab attention, something that's going to convince people that this is interesting or at least draw them in to see what they, um, if they can uh, are, to see what else that they can learn. And of course, if you're sitting at a webinar and you decide to stay around, or if you're sitting in a lecture hall, you don't have a choice after that beginning that even if you're not very interested, you're probably going to still sit there and listen to the talk. And the web, people can just back out and go to a different place. So having that first impression, even if that first impression um, is maybe a little more dramatic than the rest of your map, it can be really interesting and important. Uh, there's one type of story map called Cascade, which seems to be either people's favorite story map or their most unfavorite. It's similar to Map Journal, where you scroll, and, but in the Map Journal, the side of the bar scrolls, so your sidebar scrolls, um, while the image on the right stays the same until you hit the next section. This one, Cascade, the entire page moves and scrolls from top to bottom. So this is one called the Ocean, for example, which I pretty sure was the first version of this that ever as reproduced and the first page was just simply this word these words you know a title and a little bit of a description and that was it 
But even more dramatically, instead of having it be an image, it's actually a video. Now, are there videos throughout the rest of their website or the rest of the story map? There's not a ton of videos. But this is something I'll say, and you may uh, not like the fact that our brains do work this way, especially now more in social media. This is something that's fairly dramatic. It also is interesting in that it is related to the ocean, it's related to water, and it makes you want to scroll down to find out what is next. Now, once you get into the map, it may not be as much interest, potentially, but at least that is this head-grabbing first section of the map. Another one that just came out recently is one called The Bare Earth, which is talking about, is a really good general introduction to LIDAR, which is um, something the Washington Geological Survey put together. And let me reload this map. Because what happens over time is that the images on the front of that map um, change. I had it on long enough that it stopped. Now, again, some people might think, wow, this is distracting. It's too much. I, a lot of people I've seen talk about this. Now they really want to know more <laughs> about LIDAR and how it works. So then they scroll down to try to get to find more information. So it can be that you have too much information or things are too overwhelming. And in some ways, the cascade I've seen people react negatively to it. So as always, it's really important that you know your audience. But it is very key on the web, people have very little time or are willing to spend very little time deciding if your stuff is worth looking at. So you have to try to do something that's really gonna grab them and at least convince them not to click the back arrow and to scroll down and to start to see what it is that you have to show. Now, this is a very specific tip. Maybe that oh, first one was a bit broader. This one's very specific, but it's something I wound up using, and I've heard it from um, first from Emily Wilson at University of Connecticut Cooperative Extension, who is part of a group that put together a story map a few years ago, which won, literally won awards. It was got the best educational use of story maps at this Esri International Users Conference competition. And she said, you know, legends can be really important, but inside of ArcGIS Online and inside of story maps, a legend can be a problem in some ways because you don't know, first of all, you don't have a, a, you have some control over it, but you don't have a tremendous amount of control, again, when you're just using the templates. And also, you have to decide, do you have it open? Do you have it closed? And how does it look in the map? Do people even realize that it's there? So if you have a legend on the side of your map, and this is from a, um, a map that's featured on a website that uh, I've been working to produce with other extension folks, they have a legend over here. So depending on how you're zoomed in, the legend might be in the way of something that you're trying to show. And if you think, well, I don't like the way the legend looks open because it might distract, maybe I'll click and fold it up, then you may not even, especially other folks that aren't used to story maps, may not even know that the legend is there and they might not know to click on it. So if you want your legend to definitely be visible and you want to have a lot of control over where your legend is low or what it looks like, then you can just make turn your legend into an image and have it featured right on the sidebar of your map. So this is from our, our story map about the Great Bay. I did have to make this in, well, I don't use Photoshop necessarily. I, knew, I use another program, but in any image editing program, this was a combination actually of a legend of five different maps that I made. I put them together inside one image, and that way I could control exactly how they look. These are basically just screenshots that are then put together in one image in any image editor. Um, and then I saved it off as a JPEG so that it could be in my sidebar and it could be constant. And I've seen some of Emily's uh, story maps and they have this scattered throughout. And I'm now I'm very aware of it and I look at more and more story maps and I think the, a lot of the better story maps do have that there. So if you look down at this story map where we actually have this spring debris map, instead of having a legend floating around over here, all of the information 
is right here just as an image. So it's very much visible. You don't have to worry about hiding things or people turning it on and off. In the case of this map, I decided to have all of the sightings. So these are all these sections that people were supposed to observe for marine debris. And based on the colors, it shows you what section of the area they were looking at when we assigned people sections to go look. You can also see not everybody went to the sections that they promised to go to, but a good number of people did. But in addition to just having a map that showed all of the sightings that we got and some basic information, we also wanted to show what are the areas that have, or what are the main types of debris that were found. And we had plastic, wood, tires, and then foam. And by that, I mean big chunks of styrofoam. So I used sort of the, a combination of both having this image over here that the legend would be the same for all five maps, and also what we talked about, the story actions, where you can switch back and forth between different maps. So this is a map only of the plastic bottles, a map of the wood, a map of where we found tires, and a map of where we found foam. So by switching back and forth between these and not having a legend over here, everybody just had to look at one place for the legend. They didn't have to fold it and unfold it. I could control exactly what it looked like and where it was displayed and not having to worry about having it as part of the map. And just to show you, these maps are set up such that as you go um, from these different areas of the map, the different, uh, there's no zooming that happens when you click on each of these. And then when you get back to that original map, it does zoom out to the whole Great Bay. So this might seem simple again, but sometimes I think the best tips are simple. This took a little bit of extra time. And uh, I will say, generally speaking with Legends anyway, you want to wait until the very end of your map creation before you worry too much about the legend. But this has been something that I've seen used extremely effectively, and it gets around one of the biggest problems with dealing with Legends, what they look like, and whether or not they're visible, and making sure people notice what those Legends actually represent. And I guess the last section, I'll just keep going here in the last few minutes. And this brings it back to the map that I was just showing that, I, and you've probably noticed this throughout my presentation, <laughs> really when you're communicating with story maps or maps in general or any presentation, less is more. And I've had questions about this map and said, well, hey, why would you not only show just all the plastic bottles? So for example, you have four different items here excuse me, four different items. Why didn't you show all four of those items on the map? And if you look at where they're located, in some of these places it might have worked, the reality is that these are already so close together. If I had all of these different icons shown at once, in a lot of areas they would overlap and they wouldn't be very visible at all. In fact, if you look back to here, when you zoom in, if you can imagine that those, I oops, that's too close. Those icons were these bigger different icons, they would overlap and not even really be very visible. So part of the strategy I chose, which again is based on my own sensibilities, but a lot of experience with maps, is to think about what's, what can I show individually that are different in a way that's sort of structured to show most information at once, but not be overwhelming. And often I see a lot of danger in GIS and especially online maps where people just take all of the data they have and throw it together. We'll have, you could add up to 200 different layers on the map, which turns out to actually be a disaster because the more data you show at once, the less each individual data layer speaks to you. And the good thing about story maps is you can have multiple maps. You can switch and have a map or a different piece of information on a different page. Um, so if you wanted to show pictures of the actual trash, maybe that's a completely different map. You have the ability to have lots of different sections and show different information. So unlike other maps where maybe, or other times in the past, you're trying to cram a whole bunch of information into one map, you don't really have to do that anymore. You can take the approach where you have different maps shown and make that map have the most impact that you possibly can have and then move on to the next map. So part of this is just based on your own experience, part of it's based on your own sensibilities, and as anything with graphic design or decisions along these lines, there's gonna be arguments and discussions either way. Uh, but I just put it out there 
as um, maybe a, a challenge, but also just a guiding principle to think, what do I need to show and anything else that's distracting from that point, remove it and think about it also from the standpoint of people coming to your map and what they're going to be interested in rather than you trying to put all of the information that you have into somebody's head at once. And again, the beautiful thing with story maps, you have a series of maps. You can make one point at a time and let people progress through it as opposed to thinking, okay, we have one interactive online map. We're going to put all the data layers in there and people themselves can turn on and off the different layers and look. And if they do that, maybe they'll turn on the right combination of layers and maybe they will get the point out of this that we want them to get out of it. So again, I suppose more of a philosophy <laughs> than an actual tangible tip, but something to keep in mind. And something, to be honest, is story maps offer you the flexibility and the luxury of doing where maybe a single embedded interactive online map doesn't offer as much of that same opportunity. Okay, that's the end of that section. Does anybody have any questions in the Q&A? So Shane, we do have some questions and a comment to catch up on. Um, CK asked, what kind of data do you get when the crowdsource data arrives? For instance, is it stamped with a time and date? Yes. Well, uh, as every good question, the answer is it depends. But <laughs> it, there are, number one, there should be a time and date stamp on it anyway of when it was submitted. But also, if you look back at this, for example, with the rabbits, the people themselves are putting in the time and date. So you may get potentially in a data layer the time and date it was submitted. But you can also ask here the time and date that they saw the rabbit, which obviously, in the most, for the most part, is not going to be the same exact time that those data are submitted. So yes, there's various ways that you can get date stamps. And you can even let people set the date and time. But ultimately, the system will know when it was submitted for the date and time as well. Excellent. Thank you. So um, the next question in Q&A and the comments that uh, we haven't addressed in the chat are kind of related. Um, okay. CK uh, says that you've given great examples. Um, do they work well with all browsers, slash, or, you know, et cetera? And Linda in chat has said she's found that story maps don't display videos on mobile devices. So perhaps you can address those together. Sure. The videos on mobile devices, I don't know about that. Uh, I have to test. I do know that generally speaking, they work well on all browsers. I mean, nothing works completely well on all browsers. Things are different on each, but they work. I've seen very few times where they didn't work on various browsers. One thing I'll also show you, of course, is that they are responsive and that they will be different formats. You can see this flexing itself as the screen gets smaller and then eventually turning into a mobile version where you advance through the different slides using this down below and then click here to get to that side section. Um, as far as it not playing videos in the mobile, that is a good question. Let's try. Here's the ocean one. Let's go back to the beginning of the ocean all the way back. Let me see if I move it to the mobile. What happens? Well, at least this version of it, that it is playing in the mobile. But I, I mean, to know how it would work across all, all browsers at all screen sizes, I'm not really sure. And this might even be cheating because it might be sort of pretending it's in a mobile browser, but not actually noting that it's a mobile browser. So I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I may have to experiment with that to find out. Um, sure. I, generally speaking, they work fairly well across all browsers and all screen sizes, but not always 100%. And yeah. Linda said that uh, she gives the workaround recommendation um, that she's read is to have either an image or a GIF as an alternative. Yes, definitely. I mean, part of the, whenever, the beautiful thing, <laughs> it's a great suggestion. The, the more you use GIS in any web design, or any technology, I guess, but especially GIS and web design, you sort of learn to hack around what it is you're trying to do if the technology doesn't let you do it. And also with embedding websites and story maps, you should be able to embed a website as part of that right side. Sometimes it just doesn't work um, because the website is set up a certain way or it's insecure and your story map is secure. And the good technique is that the same exact thing. Take a screenshot or something that's an image 
you could always have it in your story map that people could click to get to that website or get to that video. But to have that it's, uh, image be the thing that's displayed, it's maybe a little less sleek, but also it can be the workaround to the, the problem that you're running into based on the limitations of the technology. So, Absolutely. It's kind of having belt and suspenders, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Nancy uh, says, can you import a base map constructed in Mapbox into, Esri, in, into an Esri story? Well, there's two things. Uh, you, if you can get it embedded, so if that Mapbox map, if you can get an embedded version of that, you can put it right in because any website, well, not any, but most websites that you ha can get an embed code for, you could go ahead and embed it uh, inside of the right section as that as the feature um, so that main content could just be your embedded map from Mapbox whether or not you can put a map box background map as part of your ArcGIS online map which will show up in your story map you may or may not be able to if you send me an example of one I would definitely be willing to try it uh, if you go here in ArcGIS online and click add layer from web there's a whole bunch of different types of web services so different ways you can stream data in from somewhere else so if your map box map provides one of these you should be able to bring it in and just have it show up as another data layer inside of your ArcGIS online map um, but keep in mind so that's one option is to get your layer in the map if one of these, if you can produce one of these things as part of your map box solution. The other thing again is if you have a map box map, somehow a living online, if you get the embed code for it, you may, what's over here on the right can be anything that's embeddable. Um, although again, sometimes it doesn't work perfectly, but most cases I've had people embed Google Maps over here on the right because they've gotten the embed code from Google Maps and plopped it in and it worked just fine. So I think those are the two possibilities that I know of, at least. I'll be interested to see if it works, and if you're interested in finding out or having me try it, I'd be happy to do it, because I've never had that question asked before. So Shane, maybe if you could put your email address in the chat, so, um, so Nancy or others, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so the, um, the last thing I was going to say is that one of the things that my community, my geospatial sort of colleagues have been working on over time uh, is a website to try to provide information for extension folks and other like-minded people with examples of maps and also resources. So this uh, is called Map Assist, this website. And uh, we're looking for examples of all kinds of maps. Most of the examples we have now are story maps just because those are the ones people have been providing to us. But if there's examples of Mapbox or Google Maps, we're looking for examples of maps being used for outreach and engagement. And all the details of myself and also that website are available here. Um, what I'm going to do afterwards, and if somebody else can write those in the chat box, that would be great, but they're here. Also, the learn um, listing that had the information for this webinar, I'm going to go back through once we're done here in the next hour or so, hopefully, if not today, then tomorrow, and put all this information directly in that learn event, including the links to all the maps that I showed so that people can look back at that and have the direct links and information there. So I just put the learn link in the chat and your email address in the chat. Okay, great. Um, and let's see, we've got another question that's come in. CK uh, asks, uh, back to the public-centered data question. Can the data they entered be exported to a CSV file? I'm thinking about a potential use for evaluation purposes. Yes, definitely. Um, yep. So there's lots of different ways you can download that data and CSV are one of the formats you can get out. Uh, and then of course the question always with every technology is, you know, if, why use ArcGIS online? Like why not use Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey if that gets you what you need? Um, so I don't know that from a strict data collection standpoint, this Survey123 is any better than Qualtrics, but if you want to make maps with it, it's a lot better because the data are already living inside of that map. Um, but once you get them out, yeah, there's a ton of different ways. You can get them out as GIS data because obviously it knows the location, or you can just download the table in a variety of different um, formats like CSV that you can bring into any other sort of database program or spreadsheet program. 
Okay, and CK added um, uh, tracking the use of playgrounds, walking trails, etc. Oh yeah, yeah. There's lots of ways that this could be used, um, definitely. And again, it can be a feature of a story map. It doesn't have to be a story map, but um, the same technology that runs story maps allows you to do this in a geographic way. And I don't know. I know at least I know at UNH, it turns out that our Qualtrics doesn't have. We didn't. We don't have the ability to upload a file. So you might say, well, we want to just take pictures and collect pictures. Well, it turns out our version of Qualtrics that we have at the university doesn't allow that, but ArcGIS Online does. So if we wanted to collect pictures from people, even if maybe we weren't so interested in the location, it turns out ArcGIS Online is still better to do that. Um, if we had a data form to collect pictures, we couldn't even do that with the version of Qualtrics that we have. That's interesting. Sometimes I mean, they never it's consider kind of like off-label use of prescriptions, right? <laughs> it's funny because in the survey itself, when you build Survey123, the location is a feature that you have to choose. You could even build a Survey123 survey with no location. It's just an element, just like you have a text box, you want date, you want drop-down menu, you drag on location. So you could potentially build a Survey123 survey and not even feature, have location be one of the items, which seems kind of counter counterintuitive. Although the idea of having a story map with no maps in it is also counterintuitive, and there's plenty of story maps that don't have a single map in them. So, <laughs> yes, off, off, off label uses, I guess. I haven't heard anybody say that before. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I don't see any more questions at this time. You know, we still have a few minutes together, but I also want to um, let folks know that. Um, we'd like to have your feedback for today's session, and I, um, it only takes a minute. I put in a link to our evaluation. We want to know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, what your aha moments and what's still unclear, what, how we can help you um, in future sessions. So yeah. please let us know in the one minute evaluation. And the other thing I mentioned at the beginning, but I'll mention again, is that we have lots of different webinars that happen before this about story maps. Um, all of them are available on that Map Assist website. They're also available on Learn. Uh, dot extension dot org. But uh, if you need more background about story maps or see more in depth about how you might create one, you either go to learn or you go to this website. Uh, there's a lot of there's links to all of the previously recorded webinars on both places. So excellent. I'm going to also put in a link um, to uh, more about the Impact Collaborative, because this session is part of the Impact Collaborative from the extension, um, as well as uh, highlight that tomorrow we're having uh, impact, another Impact Collaborative webinar called uh, Finding Inspiration Through the Food Systems Impact Collaborative. And um, I have a link to the Learn uh, session for that, if you're interested. And I'm going to lastly put in the mapassist.org in the chat as well. And I think we are uh, just about out of time and uh, very thankful for everyone uh, who participated today. Fabulous questions um, and as usual, wonderful information, Shane. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Great, well thank you so much for inviting me to do so and thanks for all the help Molly and Mark in getting this up and running and leading me through it. Thanks folks, bye-bye. Bye-bye.